What is a species? While this may seem like an easy answer, there is a lot of scientific debate about what makes a group of animals truly unique. And even more complicated, what constitutes a subspecies? A subspecies is defined as a rank below species, used for populations that live in different areas and vary in size, shape, or other physical characteristics, but that can successfully interbreed. In this video, we're looking at five interesting subspecies that stand out among the rest. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you like this kind of content, then please consider helping me out by liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing to the channel. And I need to say a special thanks to all of my patrons. Without their support, I wouldn't be able to make my content on a regular basis. If you want to join me on Patreon, the link is in the video description below. I really appreciate your support. On the west coast of North America lies a rainforest that many don't even know exists. The Pacific Temperate Rainforest is the largest temperate rainforest in the world, spanning from southern Alaska to northern California. The rainforest is dominated by mountainous landscapes, covered in dense, moss-covered forest. On the coast of British Columbia, Canada, lies the Great Bear Rainforest. It covers 6.4 million hectares, making it roughly the size of Ireland, and it's home to one of the most unique and mysterious subspecies on Earth, the Kermode bear. While the majority of Kermode bears look just like other American black bears, what makes this subspecies special is a recessive gene that drastically changes the appearance of between 10 and 20 percent of them. Instead of being born with black fur, these black bears are born white. Somewhere between 100 and 300 white Kermode bears live in the wilds of British Columbia today. And what's really interesting about the Kermode bears is that they aren't albino. Albinism is the lack of melanin production in the body, and it affects the hair, eyes, and skin. But the white Kermode bears have regularly pigmented skin and eyes. It's only their fur that's white. White Kermode bears are known as spirit bears, and they hold cultural significance among the First Nations communities of the region. They came to be symbols of peace, harmony, and balance. When Europeans arrived on the west coast in the late 18th century, the native people groups knew that they were mostly looking for fur to send back to Europe. They decided to keep the spirit bears and their location a secret to protect them. It's believed that this genetic adaptation rose during the last ice age, and the isolation of the Kermode bears, especially on islands, helped preserve the mutation within the population. In fact, the Kermode bears on islands are two to three times more likely to be white due to the preservation of their genetics from geographical isolation. Recent studies show that their coloration has modern day benefits. In the fall, the bears rely on salmon fishing to gain much needed fat to get them through the winter. Salmon instinctively avoid large dark shadows over the water to protect themselves from being eaten by bears. But the spirit bears blend in with the sky above. They are in fact about 35% more adept at catching fish than their black furred companions, simply because the salmon don't know how to avoid them. Today, much of their range is protected from logging, and in 2022, the government of British Columbia and the First Nation groups of the province moved to ban Kermode bear hunting within native territories. But the bears are still facing threats. Overfishing of wild salmon stock has meant less food for the bears to eat. Hunting outside of protected areas is still allowed, and about 50% of the bears live outside of these protected areas. And a lack of resources in the province has meant that the much larger grizzly bear has been encroaching on Kermode territory. Black bears are easily killed by grizzlies, so as soon as a grizzly is detected, the black bears move on from the region. Despite this, 
their population is still considered stable for the time being. The Komodi bear was the official animal of the Vancouver 2010 Olympic Games and is the provincial mammal of British Columbia. The Faroe Islands are an autonomous territory of Denmark, situated in the North Atlantic. About 350 species of bird have been recorded on the islands, including the common raven. On the Faroe Islands and in Iceland, the common raven is less glossy than other raven subspecies. It also has white bases on the feathers around the neck. It was given the epithet Corvus corax varius and is known as the North Atlantic Raven. While it's normally black, the Faroe Islands had a color morph that could only be found there. They were a mix of black and white, with the white mainly focused on the head, wings, and belly, and their beaks were brown. This color morph was known as the Pied Raven, but we know little about them today. In the 13th and 14th century, Early writers from Iceland wrote a series of ballads about the settlement of the Faroe Islands. One was the Elder Ballad of Birds, in which 40 species of bird from the Faroe Islands are mentioned. Among them are the now extinct Great Auk and the Pied Raven. It's the first record of the birds known to exist. Over the coming centuries, they were mentioned in reports by several European visitors to the islands. In 1828, a German judicial counselor to the Faroe Islands mentioned that the white ravens were much rarer than the black ones, but still common on the islands, having personally seen 10 of them. Also, in the mid 19th century, Danish painter Dürker Askarvenesi made this painting of birds he saw on the Faroe Islands. In the bottom right corner is what is believed to be a pied raven, making this the earliest depiction of the bird. At the same time, collecting birds was a popular hobby in Europe, with collectors paying high prices for rare species. The Pied Raven was a target of this practice. To make matters worse, ravens and birds of prey were seen as pests. This led to the King of Denmark issuing a royal decree that every male on the Faroe Islands had to kill at least two birds of prey or raven every year, or they would be fined. It only took a few decades for the black and white color morph of the North Atlantic Raven to disappear, with the last confirmed pied raven being shot in November of 1902. But this wasn't a true extinction. The black color morph is still present on the Faroe Islands today. Instead, it was an unnatural genetic drift. By targeting the birds that carry the genes to produce the black and white color morph, they were no longer able to pass their coloration on to the next generation. While it may still be present as a recessive gene among the current raven population, and a few all-white birds have been spotted over the last century, no black and white raven has been seen on the Faroe Islands since 1902. Only 16 specimens survive in museum collections today. Giant pandas once ranged throughout southeast China, but at some point became extremely rare, becoming limited to only a few mountain ranges in the center of the country. Because they've been rare for at least the last two millennia, they hardly feature in Chinese art or culture. In fact, this has led to a popular conspiracy theory on the internet that pandas aren't real at all, but just people in bear costumes. Because of their rarity, even the Chinese knew little about them. In the 2nd century BCE, the Empress Dowager Bo was buried with a panda skull, probably because the animal was considered extremely rare and was associated with bravery and righteousness. Their rarity also protected them from being used for almost any traditional Chinese medicine or cuisine, which today has helped contribute to their conservation. It wasn't until 1869 that any Westerner would record the species, and it wasn't until the 1930s that they would make their way into zoos outside of China. In 1958, China would begin its Great Leap Forward. This led to much of the country being converted into farmland 
to support the now exploding population. This was bad news for the pandas, especially because a new subspecies was discovered the very next year, in 1959. Pandas that lived in the Kindling Mountains were geographically separated from other pandas for a long time. Recent studies suggest that they may have been isolated for as much as 10,000 years, leading to distinct differences in their appearance. The most obvious differences are in their fur. The Kindling Pandas are not black and white, but rather brown and white. Also, the spots around their eyes are more concentrated below the eye, giving them the appearance of being tired. They also have skeletal and dental differences, with their skulls being slightly smaller than other pandas, and their molars being slightly larger. They're extremely rare, and with the general decline in panda populations, the kindling pandas were almost wiped out. They were counted in 2001, and only about 100 were still surviving in the wild. In 2005, scientists Qiu Hongwan, Hu Wu, and Sheng Fang released their research on the kindling pandas in the Journal of Mammalogy. They proposed that these brown and white pandas deserve to be classified as a subspecies, making them the first recognized subspecies of panda to date. Today, their population sits at less than 300 wild animals, and thankfully, a lot of work is being done in China to protect pandas, ensuring that the kindling pandas survive for generations to come. The largest species of canine in the world is the gray wolf, and it has an impressive range, living across much of Asia, Europe, and North America. Because of the huge range of the species, it has a diverse set of subspecies. In fact, there are currently over 30 subspecies of gray wolf recognized, including the Japanese wolf, tundra wolf, dingo, and even the domestic dog. But the smallest of all the subspecies is also one of the rarest. The Arabian wolf inhabits desert regions of the Sinai and Arabian peninsulas and is critically endangered. For a long time, it was considered to be the same subspecies as the Indian wolf, but in 1934, it was recognized as its own subspecies owing to its smaller size and smaller skull. The Arabian wolf is one of the most southerly occurring subspecies of gray wolf. As such, it has developed specific adaptations to survive in the dry desert habitats it calls home. Its coat is shorter and thinner than other subspecies, and it has a sandy color to help it blend in. Being smaller, the Arabian wolf also tends to prefer smaller prey, like rodents, birds, and baby ungulates. The scarcity of prey also means that they're unable to support larger pack sizes. Arabian wolves prefer to hunt in pairs or trios in order to maximize efficiency and food availability. They've also been documented working alongside other species within their range. In one instance in Israel, an Arabian wolf pack was documented hunting alongside a striped hyena. Today, there may be as few as 1,000 Arabian wolves left in the wild, with their biggest threats being human persecution and hybridization with domestic dogs, which aren't adapted to live in the desert. Off the western coast of South America lies one of the most interesting sets of islands in the world, the Galapagos. Ever since they were written about by Charles Darwin after he visited in 1835, they've held an important place in the field of biology. The diversity of species on the islands played a huge part in how Darwin developed his theory of evolution. The key players in his study were the finches of the islands. Despite being some of the most studied animals of the last two centuries, scientists still cannot agree about them. Some classify them as separate species. Others view them as a single species of finch with many subspecies. Regardless, scientists agree that they all come from a single ancestor. On a couple of tiny islands in the north of the archipelago is what might be the most interesting of them all. The vampire ground finch. 
which some consider to be a subspecies of sharp-beaked groundfinch, is set apart not so much by its appearance, but by its behavior. And as you may be able to tell from its name, it has an interesting diet. During the rainy season, the birds are quite happy to eat what most of the other finches on the Galapagos eat, with their diets consisting mainly of seeds and invertebrates. But during the dry season, the vampire finches take advantage of what's available to them. For starters, they'll drink nectar from the prickly pear cactus, which is already quite an unusual behavior for a finch. But there's another available source of food on the islands that they take advantage of, nesting seabirds. Vampire finches will actually approach a bird sitting on its nest and peck at them until they draw blood. They have a preference for Nazca and blue-footed boobies, and interestingly, the birds show almost no resistance to the finches as they do this. As they bleed, the vampire finch consumes the blood, getting both nourishment and hydration in the process. They've also learned to steal freshly laid eggs, cracking them open on rocks and eating what's inside. The vampire ground finch is listed as vulnerable, mostly because of their extremely limited range and the introduction of a variety of species that are destroying their habitat. And that's it for today's video. Have you heard of any other interesting subspecies? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.